Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, global currency. That's a it's a tr- it's a tough walnut to crack, right? Because it, an extent, requires people. It requires people. I shouldn't say people. It requires governments to want that to happen. Um, and uh, I think a great example of this is um, uh, when Facebook tried to launch Libra a couple of years back. I'd like to welcome everyone to another episode of the Let's Gather podcast. I'm your host, Zeke, and in this episode, I have Nicholas to speak about blockchain, cryptocurrencies, and the load project. I'd like to give a content warning for any strong language used in this episode, and hope you have a nice day, and enjoy the show. Record. So, I want to thank you for coming on the podcast. Sorry, I missed that. Can you <laughs> start from the top? <laughs> so, <laughs> three, two, one. So I'd like to thank you for coming on the podcast. Hey, it's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. No problem. Thank you for being interested. So. So, <laughs> <laughs> so the first question I would like to ask is, what would your origin story be and how would you like to represent it? So it could be like a story, a book. Could be yeah, a ab- absolutely. My origin story is, uh, you know, uh, way back in 1991, I was born uh, in Winnipeg, uh, Canada. And uh, I actually spent the first few years of my life being raised in California on the border of Compton and uh, gradually made up my way through the West Coast. Little did I know at that time that I would have the opportunity uh, to work in uh, one of the most exciting emerging uh, technologies in in human history. Um, Flash forward 2021, uh, I've been working for almost half a decade now in the blockchain arena. Uh, and the arena hasn't been around that long. So anybody that says they've been in blockchain for 20, 30 years is lying to you because the technology didn't exist yet. Um, but I've been, I've been in the space for a very long time now. And um, uh, I work as a COO, uh, which is a chief operating officer for a team of 70 people um, that is producing uh, stabilized cryptocurrencies. Uh, so currencies that are backed by silver and gold kind of like the gold standard in the United States dollar used to be and um, bringing to life mobile wallets payments technology so that people can spend cryptocurrencies with businesses and merchants and merchants can accept those currencies and and switch back to uh, their their regular old US dollar when they need to. So uh, that's kind of my origin story. Um, Glossing over some of the (laughs) more awkward years like high school, I'd like to just keep that forgotten and suppressed down there you can stay where it belongs um but yeah um it's a really really awesome experience to be on the forefront of, of crypto like most of the world's finances are moving over to blockchain technology and at the time when i got in the market which is like 2016 2017 there were only 7,000 people in the world who could even code a blockchain um so it was it was very very small and it hadn't quite exploded yet and so uh you know uh, now we're at this point where almost everybody and even your grandma has probably been like, how do I get some Bitcoin? Right. So it's, it's crazy to, to watch that go from something very small into something huge that's consuming the entire world. Nice. Yeah. And before we get into blockchain, how would you represent your origin story? Would you, would you, what kind of medium would you choose to do it? Oh, look, look how would I present it? If yeah. it were a, Oh man, I I don't know. Probably like a Netflix series. I probably get have like one season and get canceled, but that's okay with me. <laughs> nice. Cool. So now let's get into the meat and everything. Blockchain. So what kind of brought you into the technology? Yeah, for sure. So I mean, uh, what brought me into the technology was the idea that uh, the money that we had was bad, right? Uh, and I was I was actually consulting an e-commerce, so like a Shopify business. Uh, guy was actually a really good artist um you know very very renowned artist that i was working with and um he says i want to accept cryptocurrencies and i go what the hell is a cryptocurrency (laughs) um which i think is how most people learn about blockchain technology i think somebody just comes to them and says bitcoin and they're like what right so uh i started looking into it and be like okay this guy wants to accept this stuff in his business is it safe what is it all about and 
uh, I started going down this rabbit hole of understanding monetary policy and understanding how the money that we use in the world works, um, the pros and the cons of it. And it became really apparent that the money we have sucks, right? Um, it, it inflates. So um, year over year, it loses purchasing power. So there's more money in circulation and the value of that dollar is actually going down. That's why when I was a kid, what you used to be able to buy for $1 now costs you $2, right? Um, and that just happens uh, consistently year over year. So, and in worst case scenarios, your money goes into a state of what's called hyperinflation. So this is what's happened in Venezuela and Zimbabwe and any number of other countries around the world is that um, it basically becomes worthless. Like, you know, uh, millions, uh, millions of dollars effectively can barely buy you a bro loaf of bread is what I'm talking about here. Uh, and people, we in the Western world uh, feel maybe a little bit safe from that, but um, there is no reason to believe that the way that it's done here in the Western world is done so slowly that it's like a frog boiling in water. If you've ever heard that metaphor, right? The temperature re gradually rises and the frog doesn't jump out because it doesn't realize it's being cooked. Um, and, and the same logic is here with the money. Eventually we're going to reach a point where $10,000 or a hundred thousand dollars doesn't really mean that. Uh, and I'm sure you probably subconsciously you've already felt that. Like when somebody used to say a hundred million dollars, you're like, that's a lot of money. Now somebody says a billion dollars and you're like, no, oh, that's not, that's not like a lot, you know, like it's not Jeff Bezos money. That's not Elon Musk money, right? We need to go to hundreds of billions of dollars, getting into the trillions of dollars. And that is because of inflation. So here I am looking at this going, okay, there's a real use case in, around having better money. Um, and so, you know, I got really excited about Bitcoin and about some of the other altcoins at the time that were uh, coming into the play and coming into the forefront. And I was like, wow, this is almost like a complete inversion of what we are doing right now. Um, and then the 2016, 2017, or the 2017, uh, 2018 boom happened and uh, everything exploded, right? And every bank from here to, you know, Timbuktu was just like, it's a scam. Don't buy Bitcoin. It's evil. Like you'll lose all your money. Like, But here we are in 2021 and all these banks are like, yeah, buy Bitcoin. We're <laughs> going to move our, we're going to move Bitcoin into our pension funds. And uh, really what was taking place there was this technology was, was disrupting uh, their, their power hierarchy, right? Because banking is just a, a network a small network of, of companies is to say, you know, an old boys club of banks, um, you know, saying we are going to dictate the rules of how you engage with your money. And Bitcoin said, no, we don't need to do that. We can, there's another way, there's another solution. Um, so that's, that's how I got introduced to the technology. Um, but, uh, it became really apparent that as great as Bitcoin was, it actually still wasn't very good as money. It was great for accumulating wealth, what's called a store of value, right? When you just buy something, you hold it, you sit on it, and it goes up in value, right? Like a stock or a bond. It's great for that kind of stuff. And I do recommend that that everybody hold at least a little bit of Bitcoin. Um, not that I'm a financial advisor, so speak <laughs> to a professional. Um, but um, it became obvious that we needed uh, digital currencies that were better money uh, that were better money and, um, uh, that, that were stabilized comparatively. Um, so that's when I came into contact with load, right? And as I mentioned before, load creates stabilized money that's built for businesses. So let me paint a hypothetical situation for you. Um, let's say you go to a coffee shop, coffee is like, you know, maybe, maybe a buck 20, maybe two bucks, five bucks if you're going to Starbucks, right? And um, you, you go there and you pay with your Bitcoin. And then you look at your phone and Bitcoin goes up like 20%. So now that that coffee that you just paid for, you actually spent, you know, six, $7 or, um, you know, like 525. The point here being that the value of that, um, that coffee has now gone up because Bitcoin's price fluctuates so wildly. Um, and as a business owner, how are you supposed to give your customers fair pricing? Because, and, and me as an individual, why would I sell something that is expected to go up? It doesn't make a lot of sense. But that's where gold and silver come in. See, gold and silver throughout most of the world's history have been used as money. The United States dollar had a gold standard. 
most empires in the world, I'm talking all the way back to ancient Greece and, and, uh, and beyond, used gold and silver for money. And it worked. You know, So there's like thousands of years of monetary history here. And what has been proven to happen is that precious metals are a great store of value, but they're also a great medium of exchange, um, meaning that um, they preserve their value over time. So what a gram of gold could buy me back in the Middle Ages is pretty close to what a gram of gold could still buy me today, right? In terms of equivalent purchasing value, you know, a hundred years ago, what a gram of gold could buy me is pretty much what a gram of gold can buy me today, maybe a little bit better. But, um, but because of that, there is stability, right? And it protects people from inflation. Um, so by backing your money with these assets, um, you're, you're protecting your wealth for tomorrow. And when you want to take your wins with Bitcoin, right? So you want to get out of Bitcoin because, you know, Lambo's on the moon. And we've all, we've all gotten, you know, holding Bitcoin and it's now super wealthy. You want to take your wins. You want to lock that money in and make sure it doesn't disappear. If Elon Musk farts and says, I hate Bitcoin. Right. Um, so where do you put that money? Do you put it in the dollar, which is going to lose value year over year? No, you're going to put it in something like gold and silver. That's going to keep its wealth and stay where it's supposed to be in terms of its value. So that's, that's how load, um, uh, got started. And, I came across this project and I was like, wow, okay, this is a real, this is a real like unicorn for lack of a better phrase. And it has, has the power to really change how people engage with money. And it's been, it's been that way ever since, you know? Um, so I've dumped a ton of information on you and I apologize for going on a bit of a rant, but I'll, I'll put it back in your court. That's great and everything. I remember um, my introduction to Bitcoin was 2015 when I was seeing like a random YouTube video about it. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this is good, but there's still some things I'm missing. Yeah, right. It, 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 and, and that's really like I got Bitcoin has a soft spot in everybody's heart that's been invested in the space because it was it proved the value that blockchain could bring. Right. And it, it, it was like this there. It was like a, a rallying cry that said there is another way. Right. Yeah. We don't have to do the same thing we've always been doing. We can do something different. Um, and, and I think that's a big part of the reason why, why Bitcoin has value. It proves that that blockchain technology works and can perform, you know, its intended purpose, um, you know, outside of existing financial ecosystems and infrastructure. Um, but I still think that, um, you know, when it comes to transacting, there are, there are better options out there. So, yeah. Um, you know, it's interesting as well um, because people don't really, uh, a lot of people aren't aware that there are actually different kinds of cryptocurrencies. They, they're not all made exactly the same. There are kinds like Load uh, and our AGX and AUX coins, that's our, our digital gold and digital silver, um, respectively. Um, those are what are known as stable coins, right? And there are lots of stable coins out there now. Um, if you guys are crypto traders and you know about USDT, um, that's a great example of a stable stable coin, right? It represents a backing of a United States dollar. Um, then there are like the Ethereum's of the world, right? And Ethereum is the number two token out there. Uh, Ethereum is really different from Bitcoin because it allows for smart contracts and for people to build easily on top of it, right? Um, so it's almost like an operating system, the same way you would have a Windows or a, a Mac operating system and developers can go and they can build apps on and for this for this uh software or for this operating system in the same way ethereum and the trons and the eoses of the world are are like that they are essentially operating systems for people to put their projects onto the blockchain and to create tokenized assets for for their company for their project for whatever that may be um and that serves a really important role as well which is a, why i think even at uh 4, canadian i think it's three thousand something uh us as the time of recording this um, you know, even though it's at that, that price right now, I think it's highly undervalued and we could in the future see like 10, $20,000, uh, Ethereum easy. Um, then there is the, 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 the basic sort of cryptocurrency, which is very speculative. Um, it acts like a stock or a, or an ETF or something to that effect. Uh, and those are, those are your altcoins and those are, those are Bitcoin, right? Those things just go up and down and there's no, really logic or reason or even practical application of them right so they're not being used like operating systems like uh like ethereum they're not being used like money 
really uh, the, the way or they're not stabilized the same way stable coins are. They're basically just a token that people can pump and dump and speculate on. It will, it will go to the moon because why, right? Uh, because people want to drive the price up. So that is the third type of cryptocurrency and the one that is, you know, kind of what made the scene big. Um, and I'm all for people using that, but it's, that's the riskiest bet horse you could possibly back. Right. So common logic, any rule, like anytime you are investing, please be sure that the money you're putting into it, you can afford to lose. I know Dogecoin right now is like, <laughs> everybody wants in on Dogecoin. Uh, it was invented as a joke. It was origin. It was a meme. Right. And, um, it is still a meme, no matter what anyone says. Even if Elon Musk takes his whole little fan army and, and sends people to it, it's still a it's still a meme. And what that means is eventually it's going to crash. There, all markets are cyclical. Bitcoin, real estate, doesn't matter. It, they all go in cycles, right? And right now we are in a big sort of up period. Uh, I would argue we're even potentially hyperbolic, right? Which means that we're basically almost curving back in on ourselves. We're going, we're going so high, um, which means that there is going to be a correction. The market is going to come back down. People are going to take profits. They're going to cash out. Uh, and as soon as that consumer psychology switches, you better hope that you're not holding a product like Dogecoin because you will, you will hemorrhage cash. Um, and if you've got in low enough, maybe you'll be okay and your wins will just be smaller, but there are a lot of people out there that are buying in at the top. And so they could lose a substantial amount of money. So, you know, those kinds of assets, I would say, um, you know, they're not, they're not for beginners. If you are a beginner, if you're just starting out with Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies, get some Bitcoin, get some Ethereum, get some comfort around what you are doing before you start buying into things like Dogecoin. Because you, you could get hurt, and I don't want that to happen to anybody. Yeah. Luckily, when my friends made three hundred fifty from Doge, I was like, nice. Was like, <laughs> nice. <laughs> I like, yeah, like oh, like I said, I mean, like, yeah, lots of people are getting lucky on it, and but you know, are you are people really investing in it because they've done the research, or they're just hopping on a bandwagon because all their friends are doing it and it's going up right now, right? And um, that, there's nothing wrong with that, but you need to you need to have a strong understanding that those profits that you're seeing on your screen won't mean anything unless you actually cash out. Yeah, you have to take your wins, right? Um, you have to take your wins at some point, which is hard because emotionally we're always like, oh well, it could go up higher, right? It could go up higher. Oh, it's going to go to the moon, right? But and I think Bitcoin's going to the moon, for example, right? I think we're going to blow past a hundred thousand dollars. And it could even, I don't think that saying a million dollar Bitcoin is out of the question. I don't know, but it's not going to happen this year. What's going to happen is another market correction is going to come probably towards the beginning of 2022. And uh, who knows, Bitcoin might go down to 20,000 again, it might go down to, God forbid, 3,000 again, right? And then you're stuck. If you didn't take your profits, you're stuck holding that for three, four years until the next cycle carries again. So, you know, um, that's awesome that your friends are, are winning on Dogecoin, but, uh, make sure, make sure they take some wins, right? Yeah. Cause those wins can turn to losses real quick. Yeah. yeah. And then to, um, um go, like, go ahead. No, no, go, please, please go on. Okay. Can I go on to the, like the utility of like cryptocurrency? Can I was talking to my mother the other day about sending money to my cousin. She's like, I'm going to write a money order and send it in the mail. And I was like, we could just use, use cash app and have it. A quick and easy, safer method, and say wait, and then relying on the um mail, like even though like a useful system, there's always a chance that's that it can happen. Sorry, I apologize. My my computer uh glitched out there. Uh, can you just ask that question one more time? I was telling a story about how like the how I told my mother to use Cash App instead of using like, a yeah. money order to send money to a cousin uh, across the country. Yeah, it's been like the, the quick and easier. I mean, mm -hmm. I think that, um, like Bitcoin, like other cryptocurrencies, are falling into that mode as well. Yeah, they are, and uh, remittance is actually a really big industry that's you know uh, that's uh, performing that disruption that you were just talking about there. There, you know, the Venmo's, the Cash Apps of the world, they do a really good job of sending um, easy to like a U.S. dollar back and forth. Um, Bitcoin. Uh, can make it easy or similar cryptocurrencies can make it easy to send that stuff across the world. 
Um, because traditional remittance apps, you can pay big fees on top of that, 4 or 5%. And if you are somebody who is working as an immigrant in this country and you need to send money back home to your family, or uh, you know maybe you're an exchange student or something like that, whatever it is, um, you're losing a lot of money when you make that transfer happen. But cryptocurrencies are just like, like that, and they don't take a huge percentage off the top. So it's it's a, a really great disruption to see happen. And and like you said, what you're describing is like a much smaller um, scenario of that, um, you know, a more local scenario, we'll say of that. And um, and it's still just as practical and just as valuable, right? Um, to be able to send that kind of uh, money, that that kind of asset to somebody in a peer to peer faction. That's actually one of the great ways that that Bitcoin and cryptocurrencies are different from something like a stock and a bond. If you uh, do any traditional investing, whether it's through like a Robinhood app or something like that, good luck trying to send, <laughs> you know, a friend uh, a, a Tesla stock or, or an Apple. <laughs> like, go. Good luck trying to figure that one out, um, because these apps don't allow you to do it. But blockchains are meant for peer-to-peer -peer engagement. Um, they were built with that intention. So, um, you know, me sending you some Bitcoin is is as easy as sending regular cash at this point. Um, so that makes me, that makes me really psych excited. And that's part of the reason why it's so difficult to put blockchain back in the bag. You know, um, lots of countries are like trying to ban it, but it's really, really hard because this stuff does not operate on any government oversight. It, th this technology isn't a, it's autonomous. It works without people being in the middle of it. So as long as you have access to an internet and a cryptocurrency wallet, you can just send, receive, and nobody can walk you out of that money, which is really, I think, important for people because I think, I think we're all getting a little used to having some of our civil liberties and rights taken away, and that's pretty exhausting. It's nice to yeah. know that nobody can take my Bitcoin from me. <laughs> if shit hits the fan, pardon my French. Yeah. And then I'm thinking about how this can also lead to like a global currency or some a close variation of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, global currency. That's a, it's a, tr it's a tough walnut to crack, right? Because it, an extent, requires people. It requires people. I shouldn't say people. It requires governments to want that to happen. Um, and uh, I think a great example of this is um, uh, when Facebook tried to launch Libra a couple of years back. You know, Facebook has you know, a third a quarter of the world's entire population using it. So they're like, yeah, we're going to release our own <laughs> cryptocurrency to for payments to like 2 billion people all over the world. And they're just going to use it. And governments were like, no, right. They, just, they put the ban hammer on it and just rubber stamped. And they were like, no way, no how. And they buried them under legislation and they're still working through it um, today. Um, even though Facebook is, is working on their own cryptocurrency wallet now. Um, and it's, it's because um, that idea of a universal currency takes away power from local governments to impose uh, monetary policy on their citizens. They lose control of their population in that way uh, because they don't have the infrastructure to support Facebook's currency, right? People can't pay their taxes in it and governments want people to pay taxes. And I pay my taxes and I, you know, there's taxes are a good thing when they're applied properly. But um, that concept that something is bigger than the government currency and uh, that they won't have control over the money and they won't have control over the population of that country is really terrifying to a lot of governments. So do I want a universal currency? Absolutely. That's in part what, what Load and, and AGX and AUX that we produce are, are trying to do, right? Stable money that can people can use, send and spend everywhere in the world. But we have to work really slowly to get to that point. You know, I have to work with regulators in 135 different countries, um, you know, to, to get permission to have this type of currency be accessible to the people of that country. And that's not an easy thing to do. That is like lawyers and legal calls and documents and diagrams uh, enough to give you a headache, right? Uh, enough to give you a headache. And, um, you know, I don't know if, um, 
you know, I don't know if there's any going to be, they're ever going to be like one true universal currency, but um, certainly there are a lot of people vying for that, right? They're in, us included, right? Um, you know, China, uh, the United States dollar at this point is kind of considered the, the global reserve currency, meaning that, you know, um, you know, you go to most places in the world, you hand them a US dollar and they're going to be like, yeah, sure. I'll take it. Right. Because yeah. um, it's, it's, basically used almost everywhere um you know compared to if i go to like uh give if i come to canada and i try to give a, a local merchant a, a chinese one they'll probably be like no we don't we don't accept that there right so there uh china is for example trying to unseat uh the united states dollars uh dominance there and try to have their their money um you know become the new world currency facebook tried to become the new world rever uh, reserve currency um, but I think in the future, most people will hold the basket of these currencies, right? Yeah. They won't have, there won't be just one that everybody flocks to. Everybody will hold a little bit of Bitcoin. Everybody will hold a little bit of gold and silver. And we're going to pay with whatever makes sense to us, right? It's not like there's going to be one. This isn't Highlander. There's not, there can only be one, you know, you know, there's no, there's not Lord of the Rings. It's not one ring to rule <laughs> them all. We're going to have um, a basket of things that people will hold on to. And that's, interesting because this kind of um way of holding our money and our wealth is something that um this type of learning and um financial literacy is something that is new to the middle class um like maybe if you were like upper middle class or you took financial courses in school um you know you you would have an understanding that everybody should hold you know, stocks, bonds, ETFs, real estate, and maybe keep about 10% of your holdings in cash. That information used to kind of be like private or you would only learn it if you were privileged. But now because of the internet and because of, um, you know, because in part of cryptocurrency movement, this kind of financial literacy and this kind of stuff is coming forward a lot more and more people are understanding uh, that stuff, you know, that type of how to, how to build wealth for themselves. And that's a great thing. Um, you know, that's power to the people. I, I love to see that kind of, um, stuff um, happen. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's, that's kind of my thought on, on global reserve <laughs> currencies. It's a slow, long haul. Eventually we'll get there, but there's going to be a basket of these currencies that people hold. It's not going to be one. Yeah. With the basket, you can see that happening now with the, like you said earlier, the different cryptocurrencies used for different things and they have different things. Yeah, happening. exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, so I mean, where are we at today? Right now, um, if you want to talk about adoption really quick, um, most people um, might feel like cryptocurrency is too high for them to buy into right now, or they feel like they missed the boat. Um, where we're at in the site life cycle of adoption of cryptocurrency, and I don't know if you've seen this graph before, but um, I highly recommend anybody who will just look up adoption curve graph uh, in Google just pump it into Google, you'll get a, a couple images of it. Basically, it always goes like this, right? You have the innovators, you have the people who like invented this stuff in their, in their close network of friends. Those are the first people to adopt. Then you have your early adopters, right? You have uh, the people who are kind of like the first group of people outside of your friends and family group and your sort of immediate connections to buy into this new technology, this new way of doing things. That's what 2017 uh, 2018 was right. That was that early adoption curve. Now we're coming into what's called the early majority. Um, and by the end of 2022, we'll probably have reached the end of the early majority. Um, this is, is to paint a metaphor. This is like when Facebook was first getting popular, people were like, do you have a Facebook or do you have a MySpace? Right. And your, your crazy aunt that you see at Thanksgiving didn't have a Facebook. Yeah. She didn't even know what social media was. Right. Um, and and that's where we're at with cryptocurrency adoption right now. We're at the point where not everybody's on board, but everybody's probably heard of it at the very least. Um, so what will happen after we go into our next market correction is, you know, enthusiasm will go down for a few few years or so, probably. And then we'll go into our next big bull run, which will be uh, what we call the entry into the late majority there. So this is kind of like the peak of the mountain most people in the world um by i would imagine well, let's say 25 or 2025 2026 maybe 27 most people in the world i would argue as long as you have access to 
digital um, payments, right? So if you are in a developing nation and you don't have a ID and you don't have a bank account, like the unbanked are a big issue. And I don't know that all those people will be in by that point, but most people in developed nations will hold cryptocurrency by 28, uh, 2025, 2026. I, I'm almost 100% certain on that. Um, so if you feel like you missed the boat, you didn't, there's still time to get in. Just be, talk to an expert, talk to people who have been doing this for several years and make smart decisions with your investments and, yeah. and strap in. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Because when you're speaking about like, the, um, I think about like, how can it look? Because like right now it's pretty much, you have it then you take it out and then transfer it into something else. Like the cryptocurrency to something else. I'm trying to figure out how can we like, what kind of technology, how will it look where the, so cryptocurrency itself is like, yeah. Um, well, I mean, that's kind of what we're, sorry. I think I got a little bit of a lag from you. I apologize. My internet's just not loving me today. One more time. Okay. Friend. Now I'm just trying to figure out how will it look? Cause right now it's to turn the cryptocurrency into like a US dollar. Let's take from the US or mm -hmm. I'm trying to see if, mm -hmm. how can the cryptocurrency become the currency itself? If you're... Yeah, absolutely. So this is where we're coming in with, with load, right? So right now everybody just buys into it because they want it to go to the moon and they just, they're just speculating on it, but merchants and businesses want to be able to accept this stuff too. The technology just hasn't been there for them yet. So we're building this payment ecosystem so that, you know, you, if you hold a, a cryptocurrency wallet, whether that's an exchange wallet or something else, you can go to some, you can go to a local store and, and pay with Bitcoin or pay with load or AGX or pay with whatever currency you want to pay with that is, that is in crypto. Um, and this is the next big arms race that is going to take place in the crypto space right now. Uh, we're, we're, we're working on it over at load. Um, Visa MasterCard just recently said they will allow merchants to settle to USDC. So accept credit card payments at the point of sale and then actually settle in cryptocurrency uh, in the USDC stablecoin uh, for merchants and businesses. And this kind of technology is going to come more forward. Um, the other thing that is going to happen is that uh, lots of countries are going to start producing their own government-backed stablecoins. Um, and allow um, individuals to to trade and send and spend those as well. So the existing financial infrastructure is going to move over to using cryptocurrencies and new payment technology is going to come out um, that is uh, allows people to accept cryptocurrencies. And that's really what's going to make that shift from cryptos being really speculative to being practical tools there. The one blocker to that is um, ease of use. So right now I go on a lot of podcasts and right now when you, when most people talk to me, they go, well, how does the blockchain work? How does it, how does cryptocurrency work? And, uh, when people are going to send and spend, they're like, okay, I have my private keys. I have my public keys. I mean, uh, and they're still thinking a lot about how to actually use and send and spend this money, uh, versus something like debit visa or uh, tap and spend with your, with your iPhone, your Android, or your, uh, you know, with your, with your card, you know, you go to the grocery store, you tap, you're out. You're not thinking like, oh, this is a conversation between two banks and we're using the Visa MasterCard. You, you don't even think about it. You're just like, give me my groceries so I can go home and watch Netflix, right? Uh, and we need to get to that point with blockchain technology. When it gets so easy to use that your grandmother can just pick it up and tap and spend, that is when true adoption is going to take place. And that is when you will see that shift um, from, from the currencies that we use now to this new payment technology. Yeah. Then that would be cool. Yeah. Then everything's on a phone, essentially. I, yeah, I mean, everything, you can't go backwards, right? I know there are some yeah. people out there that, you know, they, they're just like, you know, they're like, we should go back to the olden days. But like, honestly, if you really take an objective look at it, yesterday sucked. <laughs> you know, like uh, the history, things can only go forward and we only keep improving, not without great conflict. But um, they, you can't you can't just live in the past. Eventually, physical cash is going to go away almost entirely. 
Um, they're already beginning to phase it out in some countries and we're all going completely digital, right? For better or worse, right? Um, you know, Starlink is going to change how we interact with uh, the internet, right? You have the satellite internet providers and so now nowhere in the world will you ever run out of reception and, uh, you know, kind of beats out traditional uh, internet service providers. And um, there's all of this new technology that's coming to the forefront that's actually going to really change the way that our society um, interacts with the world, interacts with our money. Um, and uh, I'm excited for it. I mean, the future is going to be weird, but it's going to be fun. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, that being said, um, you know, we've been engaged with, with Load for, for about uh, four, four years now. Um, mm -hmm. We're really excited to, to be bringing this product to market into the United States. Um, if you're interested in what we are doing and you want to come say hi to us, uh, head over to lodepay.com, loadpay.com, and um, you can either download our mobile wallet that's available in app stores from the website, or you can uh, go ahead and start um, uh, joining our Telegram channel and having a conversation with us. We're a group of people who are just really pumped to get people excited about what's happening in crypto. Um, you know, I and we do believe that this is the biggest wealth generation event of our lifetime, right? And uh, we want as many people along for this ride as possible, right? Uh, I'm not a big fan of FOMO, like fear, uh, fear of missing out. But, but the reality is, is that opportunity has a shelf life, right? There is a window of opportunity and that window is going to close one day. And I don't want anybody left behind. I want everybody on this bandwagon with us um, so we can all go to the moon together. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, I think that's a good time to stop, I guess. Drop. So, last question. Yeah. What would you name your origin story, and then we can pick up from there. My origin st story. Um, I think I would name my origin story. It seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> <laughs> um. Yeah, that would definitely be the title of my memoirs is it seemed like a good idea at the time because I am where I am right now and I live a great life and I'm really happy for the opportunity that I've been blessed with. Um, but it was, didn't come easy. It was a long ass haul um, to where I'm at now and I made a lot of mistakes along the way. So um, I wouldn't say necessarily that my entire career has been falling upwards, but yeah, it kind of feels like that sometimes. Like I've uh, it's only through a lot of mistakes and a lot of learning and a lot of failure that I have now reached a point in my career where I consider it a success, right? So it seemed like a good idea at the time. <laughs> nice. Title of my title of my memoirs. <laughs> nice. Thank you for educating us and hope your project does well. Thank you again for joining the podcast. Now it's been my absolute pleasure, Ezekiel. Take care. You too. Mm. That brings another episode of the Let's Get Podcast to a close. Again, I have to thank Nicholas for joining the podcast. For next week, I have the Blurred Explorer to speak about his book and traveling and living in South Korea. Hope continue on this day, and I hope to see you there.